Physics Inspired Models in Artificial Intelligence. Hi, my name is Mohammad Aureng Ahmed. I'm an affiliate assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science in the University of Washington, Tacoma. I will be giving this tutorial along with my colleague, Shener Alzander, uh, who's at the Electrical and Electronics Engineering Department at Istanbul University in Istanbul. The focus of the tutorial is going to be on how models that originate in physics or in how physics in general can help us understand uh, models in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So towards this end, the tutorial is divided into two parts. In the first part, I will mainly focus on and go over foundational aspects of uh, physics-inspired models in AI. And in the second part, my colleague, Shannon Alzander, will go in more technical detail regarding the relationships between physics models and models in AI. A few words about terminology. So given that uh, physics and AI as a subject in its own right is relatively new, standard terminologies across disciplines is still emerging. Uh, so for example, the same terms may have slightly different meanings in the two disciplines, uh, like entropy. Um, so whenever we come across these terminologies uh, where they have slight different semantics in physics and AI, so we will call these out. And also for this field as a whole, if you look at the literature, then uh, researchers have used uh, physics-inspired AI, physics-informed AI, uh, physics of AI, so on and so forth, to describe the same discipline or instead of overlapping uh, research endeavors, uh, which are not always exactly the same. Uh, so we will not dwell too much on this, but just to call out that this is how the literature is cur cur currently. And also we will not dwell too much on the boundaries between AI and machine learning, but mainly focus on the foundations and the techniques and cross-disciplinary connections. So we'll start with the motivation. Why physics and AI? So if you look at the history of physics, uh, so it has a very long history of unifying disparate phenomena and finding common explanations. Uh, more recently, there has been uh, some progress in applying physics to understand AI and machine learning, which is yielding very promising results for both disciplines. And especially within machine learning, uh, there are a number of research questions which remain unsolved. And so it is our hope and belief that physics may actually help address some of those problems. And lastly, physics has a long history of combining empirical rigor with theoretical rigor. Uh, this is not to say that this is absent in other disciplines, but rather it's, extreme, it's relatively prominent in uh, physics. So this is, uh, an opinion piece in the journal Science, uh, actually from a physicist, where, where the physicist called on their fe fellow researchers in physics to use their skill set to help understand the challenges uh, in deep learning or even work towards finding a theoretical foundations for deep learning. So this is something which the research community across disciplines is uh, taking note. And at even a larger level, uh, if we look at some of the newer developments which have been taking place um, in, at the intersection of physics and AI, then there is a lot of enthusiasm um, on both sides, uh, which is evident by some, some of these re recent art articles that have come about. Uh, that said, uh, one should always uh, take a skeptical eye towards whenever there's a hype, whether it's in the academia or it's in the, in the media, uh, where there are a number of challenges that the machine learning and AI community is facing, um, which require further scrutiny. Uh, so for example, there's a few years ago, uh, there was this uh, well-known, well somewhat controversial talk at NIPS by uh, Ali Rahimi, where he described that AI has turned into uh, alchemy for all practical purposes. And of course there was a rebuttal uh, from other re lead researchers. But the point being that um, 
the AI and the ML community is facing a set of challenges which require thinking outside of the box. And we believe that physics-based approaches may be one such way to address uh, and foster that kind of out-of-the-box thinking. And even beyond that, um, that researchers have, uh, researchers like Jan Lee Khan, who's uh, certainly one of the pioneers in this area, have taken note and who himself has a background in physics that in order to make further progress in theoretical foundations of uh, AI in general and deep learning in particular, we may actually need help from physics. And he gave a series of lectures to that effect um, last year at Harvard. So now from why physics in, and AI in general to why uh, this particular tutorial? Um, so it's our experience that, and history also bears out that ideas for, from physics have time and again provided fodder for conceptual developments in machine learning and AI. Uh, so with this tutorial, what we want to do is to provide background and point out synergies between physics and AI for anyone who is interested in the area, area who wants to start out and explore commonalities. And so this represents a collaboration between uh, myself, uh, who's coming from a machine learning computer science background, and my colleague, Jenner Ozender, who comes from a physics, uh, theoretical physics background. So we seek uh, to approach AI from a physics perspective and physics from an AI perspective and meet in the middle. And that's how this tutorial was born. So the goals of the tutorial can be summarized as follows. So how ideas from physics have informed progress in AI and ML in general, historically speaking, and how, what are the current developments, explore connections and synergies between the two, and also demonstrate that uh, mapping AI problems mm -hmm. to class of physical problems with only, with, where we already know the solutions and behaviors, it's possible, it, it's already possible to do so, and it can help illuminate some of the inner workings of AI and ML models. So when we talk about the interplay between physics and AI, then uh, we can approach this topic across two different axes. So first is the axes of uh, understanding an application. Um, so are we trying to understand the phenomenon, uh, let's say from a theoretical foundational perspective versus taking a more applied approach? And then the second axis being, which direction are we coming from? Um, are we trying to understand physics from the AI ML perspective or we are trying to understand AI ML from physics perspective? So the focus of the current tutorial is on the understanding uh, part but from the uh, physics perspective. That is how physics could help us understand and, and potentially advance AI. And another thing to emphasize is that uh, what we are suggesting is not something novel or new. Uh, AI and ML have always been cross-disciplinary fields. Uh, so the genesis of this field in this early era uh, has its foundation in mathematics and logic. Um, if you look at more connectionist type of thinking than uh, the work of uh, Donald Hebb, Hebb, which formed the, the foundations for Hebbian learning, uh, that comes from biology. Um, so that's more than 70 years old. And prior to that, uh, Alexander Bain uh, came up with a very similar uh, connectionist architecture independently almost a century before that. And if you look at uh, almost anything within uh, machine learning, for example, it has its uh, roots in statistical methods, uh, things like Lindermayer system, which were developed to describe growth of behaviors of plants were actually used subsequently for describing grammars. Uh, there's a whole field of biologically inspired computing, the most famous example being ant colony optimization. Uh, uh, if you look at Bayesian, more recent techniques like Bayesian rule list they, has its roots in statistics, frequent pattern mining, and uh, even functional analysis in social networks. Uh, within the domain of explainable AI, we have uh, sh uh, the shape framework, which uses uh, shapely values, and that 
actually comes from uh, developments in game theory from the 1950s. So continue on the theme of why uh, physics and AI. Uh, so the physics inspired models we believe can do offer us possibility to address some open and pressing problems in AI and ML. Uh, so understanding black box models, improving deep learning models in your data poor domains and challenges that we are currently uh, facing in domains of transfer learning and active learning. And, and many of these, of course, translate into more efficient models which reduce cost of training, for example, or even deployment. So the goal is that they perhaps uh, these synergies, these insights could lead to more efficient algorithms and models. In general, there is a call in the uh, community, especially from more well-established researchers regarding the need for new ideas. So this is not to deny that tremendous progress has been made over the last decade or so in terms of um, just the number of, of publications and the number of people who are working in this area. Um, but that said, uh, researchers have also noticed uh, what is being touted as uh, the decrease in level of empirical rigor. Um, and it seems that so in a, in a well-known paper, um, uh, the researchers pointed out that uh, a lot of recent pro progress is uh, incremental algorithmic progress in nature. And one of the reasons is that for a lot of empirical studies, problems become challenges to be solved instead of focusing on developing new insights, new ways of looking at the world. Uh, so just to highlight this, so here are examples of some recent, uh, over the last few years, uh, large scale studies uh, where it was shown that the supposed progress in the AI ML side was um, somewhat illusionary. Uh, so in the first one, uh, so a large scale comparison of GANs revealed that uh, if one is given sufficient compute time and parameter optimization, even quote unquote bad models can outperform quote unquote good models. And if we take uh, tasks like sequence to sequence learning models, then it's actually possible to uh, beat state of the art by doing hyperparameter tuning on just simple baseline uh, LSTM models. In terms, even in terms of the architecture uh, for study on uh, certain encoder decoder style networks uh, demonstrated that if you have a very simple attention based model uh, that could actually outperform much more sophisticated architectures. Um, and the story goes on and on and on even in some something similar has been uh, observed in Bayesian deep neural networks, um, which seem promising at a time uh, where it is possible um, possible to actually use uh, simple baselines to be the state of the art. And of course there's subsequent work with respect to these uh, where people have tried to remedy these, but this problem as a whole uh, still exists. So a possible rebuttal to this is uh, what I described is that, uh, well, we are living in, in a different era, science has evolved. Uh, so we look at the trajectory of science, uh, we have, um, where initially what was just theoretical science, empirical science, uh, we also have the, the, the computational paradigm and um, more recently people talk about the data-driven science or the fourth paradigm, all of these being uh, complementary to each other. Uh, so this notion that uh, if you have data then you do not need uh, theory, um, but it turns out that uh, after the initial uh, enthusiasm regarding this particular notion, that's actually not true. So issues regarding data deluge and being overwhelmed by data and not being made sense of theory, it's not new. Um, I mean, John Tukey was talking about this more than 50 years ago, and here we are. Um, so you all, one always needs uh, theory to understand uh, what's going on. And the reason is that uh, theory-based models, uh, they encapsulate uh, causal or cause effect relationships, um, which are often derived from first, first principles. Uh, 
Uh, so data does not technically uh, talk uh, or speak for itself. Uh, there's always a lens of theory which is present. Uh, and so this actually, uh, folks who have been working on this um, in this area for a while would recognize that there was a debate to this effect uh, just over a decade ago regarding um, is the data deluge characterized by big data? Is that, is that leading to or going to lead towards the end of theory? And our, as our experience in the last 10 years have shown, uh, that is actually not the case because big data needs, well, big theory. So to illustrate, uh, consider the example of uh, Google fruit, flu trends. Um, uh, there, this, and uh, after a widely publicized paper was published in Nature, uh, arguing that uh, Google flu trends uh, do not work as intended. The reason being that um, if you look at the forecast prediction, uh, by, by what Google's models uh, were predicting versus reality, there is a differential of uh, sometimes overestimating by twice uh, and in general uh, over predicting. And so this was uh, held as by, especially by the media, uh, for one to talk about trial by media as an example of why um, these uh, data driven models do not work. However, if you look at researchers who actually were going to use this data for flu prediction, then it turns out that, and here's the direct quote, that uh, Google flu trends is the only source of external information with statistically significant forecast improvement. So it's not that the model does not work, or it's more like the model does not work uh, in its own right, but if you combine this with more traditional models, uh, it turns out that this ensemble uh, model actually works better than just having a more agnostic model. So from here, we move on to one of the problems which is facing machine learning these days, which is proliferation of models with a massive number of parameters. So we take a lesson from the from history of physics. Uh, so consider the following. Uh, so it's actually a common misconception amongst a lot of people that one of the reasons that the Copernicus is heliocentric model with sun at the center worn out uh, from the geocentric model that the earth is at the center of the universe is because it had more predictive power. So it turns out that for almost a century, uh, the older geocentric model actually had ad an advantage in terms of uh, predictability of more complex uh, astrophysical phenomenon. The reason that the Copernican model initially won out was uh, because of the following. It was a much more simpler and elegant model. Um, in modern uh, parlance, we would say that it has uh, very fewer uh, parameters as compared to, say, the geocentric model. And if you take a larger view of history, um, then we observe the following. Uh, so after Copernicus came up with this model, uh, Tycho Brahe made detailed observations about the orbits of the planets, which was then used by Johannes Kepler to derive laws um, known as the, uh, the, the three laws of planetary motion, uh, which were very model uh, agnostic, uh, that they did not provide any uh, foundations with respect to why that particular behavior was being observed, but it did provide a mathematical formulation. And almost a century later, uh, from the time of Tycho Brahe, that Isaac Newton unified all of this, uh, these phenomenon and a host of uh, additional phenomenon by just set of two uh, sets of laws, the laws of gravitation and laws of motion. Uh, so, which brings us to the current context. Uh, so if you look at like some more recent, extremely well-performing models, uh, let's say like GPT-3, uh, so we're talking about, 
tens of billions of parameters uh, trans translates into uh, billions of dollars. And yet, if you take a very similar view uh, from physics that um, you're focusing on looking towards things which we can generalize the underlying principles, then or perhaps we can find ways to uh, summarize things in a much more succinct manner. Which brings us to a brief history of physics and AI. So as I mentioned earlier, so there's a long history of ideas from physics permitting and inspiring progress in AI and machine learning. Uh, a very uh, relatively less known fact is that the Kalman filter, which is one of the most widely used algorithms in computing, actually has its roots in physics, even MCMC methods. They were developed to address problems in statistical mechanics in the 1950s. Uh, Statistical physics-based approaches for uh, low-rank matrix optimization uh, um, have their roots in physics, became very popular in the 1980s, and again, after the rise of massive social networks in the early 2000s. Uh, and also uh, for uh, stochastic block models, which are widely used in clustering, uh, so they have their roots in spin glass theory. And in the field of uh, deep learning, so if you look at formalization of autoencoders and how field networks, uh, what we observe is that uh, the it, that a lot of there was actually a lot of interest uh, from the physics community in the 1980s uh, when connections between autoencoders and spin glass series were uh, discovered by physicists, um, and we will go over these in much more detail uh, in the second half of the tutorial. Uh, Boltzmann's machines, as the name uh, uh, shows, they also have their roots in, in physics. Uh, they were invented uh, to add stochasticity to networks to avoid them getting stuck in local minimum, which was the problem with uh, the standard formulation of Hopfield field networks. And so more, if you look at more recent developments, uh, so information bottlenecks, um, again, coming from the physics domain, um, or at least having uh, inspiration from there, uh, offer a possibility to understand deep learning, um, uh, certain types of autoencoders um, are very closely related to techniques which are used in signal processing in physics. Uh, and there's also been work in incorporating loss functions uh, using differential e equation constraints uh, from physics within the deep learning models themselves. So a lot of uh, work uh, in that uh, direction towards this goal. So with, the, with some of the foundational framework uh, laid down and a historical overview, so now we move on to some of the, some of the larger topics that we are interested in. Uh, we'll start with the generalization in uh, physics and AI. Uh, so it's well known that generalization is a fundamental challenge in uh, machine learning. Uh, and, uh, and it's partially because uh, gen more often than not, generalization also requires, uh, uh, let's say, access to uh, massive amounts of data or having a theoretical understanding of the underlying phenomenon. Uh, so if we contrast that with uh, physics-based models where they're mostly not data de dependent um, and when such models capture the underlying phenomenon, uh, they perform extremely well on unseen data, even on data from different distributions uh, and physics-based uh, and theories and predictions from the physics domain um, have shown to be correct in, in certain uh, domains like particle physics to be, to have a correct prediction even, even to the order of, let's say eight to 10 decimal places, um, which is quite remarkable. However, if we look from the machine learning side, then, well, uh, the existing learning theories, which are mostly based on considering worst case um, 
uh, back learning scenarios with generalization bounds. Then we are unable to explain the success of deep learning. Why should it be successful at all? Uh, again, with the disclaimer that there has been some progress uh, made in this direction, but not a whole lot or not as much as we would like. And yet deep learning works really well in practice. So now a uh, classic paper uh, comes into mind. Uh, to understanding deep learning requires rethinking generalization. Uh, so what is really interesting about this work uh, is that uh, so the researchers, they started with uh, uh, deep learning networks and for the outcome variable, uh, so instead of using a real variable, they just fit uh, random variables. Um, that is, uh, they took random, they generated random labels and fit a model into that. And they, and they uh, observed a number of things which uh, somewhat at that time seemed uh, somewhat counterintuitive. So for example, uh, regularization, or at least explicit regularization, uh, may improve generalization, but it's actually not necessary or sufficient for controlling the generalization error. Um, so going back to the experiments uh, that these researchers uh, performed, so again, we are looking at models with a massive number of uh, parameters. Um, and what they're observing is that they are able to fit the new models, um, these models with this new fake data. So it's just random noise. Uh, CNNs are able to fit these models as, go as good as simple data. And the results are really puzzling. So what exactly is going on? So here's a summary of their, uh, uh, some of their uh, results and observations. That generalization is not happening uh, because of the learning algorithm or or because the hypothesis space is uh, restricted uh, or because of algorithmic stability. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, even regularization is not really contributing towards this. It's, it's better to conceptualize it as a hyperparameter that is useful in fine tuning. It's actually the inductive bias which is somewhat influencing gener generalization. Uh, so maybe there's uh, so there are some models which are likely making use of massive memorization uh, in combination with learning low complexity patterns. But it's a somewhat counterintuitive results. So from generalization, uh, we move on to com uh, computational complexity. Um, so for the benefit of uh, people, researchers from uh, the physics background, who may not be familiar with uh, computational uh, complexity. So I'll define, first define some, com some uh, foundational concepts, uh, so which, which would be familiar uh, for, uh, for the overwhelming majority of computer scientists. Uh, so in a very simplified uh, way, computational complexity theory is concerned with the question of what are the decision problems for which efficient algorithms exist. Uh, and so we address problems like uh, studying complexity classes, which are basically a set of problems of related complexity. In general, um, a large number, if not most, uh, and definite but not all, complexity classes are defined by three main characteristics. So what is the problem type? Um, so it, it, is it a decision problem? Is it, for example, an optimization problem, so on and so forth? What kind of model of computation is being used? Um, Turing machine um, versus, say, non-deterministic Turing machine, uh, Boolean circuits. Uh, what are the uh, resource bounds in terms of runtime, in terms of, of uh, let's say, memory available, so on and so forth? Uh, so this goes back to what was classically known as the Enschleidung's uh, problem that given an input, um, answering yes or no according to whether the statement is universally valid or not. Um, it's a well-known problem in the domain of uh, mathematics. 
uh, so there are connections between these two. And in the interest of time, um, uh, it's, uh, it would suffice just to state that, again, mainly for the benefit of uh, physicists in the audience, that it's a major area of research in uh, theoretical computer science. And there are known hierarchies of these complexity classes that uh, computer scientists are interested in. So there are a few which require a special mention. Uh, so a class of problems which can be solved uh, in polynomial time. So they're what are known as the SP, the complexity class P, and ones which are can be solved uh, in polynomial time by non-deterministic Turing machines are what are known as the complexity class NP. And another class uh, of interest is uh, recursively enumerable. So these are problems which uh, for which, uh, let's say, a yes answer can be verified by a Turing machine in a finite amount of time. So we are take, taking this detour, uh, uh, which may not seem uh, relevant at first, but the dividend towards the end uh, will show that, uh, show connections across uh, several domains within computing and physics. All right. Uh, so we talked about the polynomial class. And so there's another um, uh, 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 subclass for complexity uh, known as the Boolean satisfac satisfiability problem or SAT. So it's the problem of determining if there exists an interpretation that satisfies a given Boolean formula. And uh, that there exists actually a polynomial time um, uh, Benny to one reduction um, uh, from the Boolean satisfiability problem. Uh, and within that, there is these three sat complexity class, um, which focuses on satisfiability of a formula in conjective normal form. Uh, so made up of these horn class, these horn classes, where at at best, we have uh, three literals within each uh, class. And so satisfiability uh, for, again, for the benefit of the physicists uh, is defined in terms of, can we replace these literals with true and false so that the state, we can come up with a universal class um, where this formula is always true. So, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, there was a spate of interest uh, from the physics domain in understanding uh, uh, some of these complexity classes, which yielded some interesting uh, results. For example, so it's been observed that, so for the class of three SAT classes, a complexity class, a phase transition is observed. So think of a phase transition as um, how suddenly um, uh, states of matter change from one class, one uh, phase to the other. So solid, liquid, gas. Uh, so the phase transition is observed that there is a, so that's uh, if we plot, say, the ratio of clauses to variables and the probability of finding a satisfiable solution, then there is a particular point where uh, the number of the possibility of finding such solutions uh, rapidly de decreases. And so this behavior, this phenomenon is very similar to what we observe in phase transitions in uh, physics. All right, so that's one interesting uh, result uh, coming from the physics domain. And so beyond that, again, this is uh, another detour that we have to take. So we start with, uh, not with physics, but with mathematics. Uh, in 1976, the mathematician Alan Counts uh, conjectured that it should be possible to approximate many infinite dimensional matrices with finite dimensional ones. A few years after that, uh, in the physics domain, uh, Boris uh, Sarlson conjectured that the tensor product and commuting up operator models of entanglement were roughly equivalent. So details for the computer sciences in the audience, so the details are less relevant uh, other than that. So entanglement is a phenomenon which is observed in 
um, in elementary particles um, or a group of part elementary particles where where the properties of these particles are entangled in the sense that we cannot measure the properties of these particles uh, of individual particles without measuring it uh, for the entangled particles uh, or for the groups of entangled particles. All right, so this is where things get really interesting. Uh, so it was shown that, so there's another class, complexity class known as the MIP star class, uh, which is defined as follows. So it's the class of problems that can be verified through interactions with uh, entangled quantum provers. And it is equivalent to the class of recursively enumerable, enumerable uh, complexity class. Uh, so if these two are equivalent, then well, uh, both the Seidelson problem uh, as well as the Kahn's embedding conjecture, they are false. And early this year, it was demonstrated that these are indeed false. So the implication is remarkable that uh, what that these seemingly unrelated problems in mathematics, uh, physics, and uh, complexity, um, com computational complexity in computer science, they have a common uh, solution that is proving or disproving one uh, leads to important applications in the other two. So from generalizability to complexity, now we move on to uh, interpretability and explainability in, in AI and machine learning. Uh, so before we go into the relevant concepts in uh, physics, it is important to describe that there are multiple notions of uh, interpretability and explainability in machine learning and AI. Um, uh, so concepts which do not have the exactly the same meaning, but rather overlapping meanings. Uh, and in layperson's terms, one way to describe this is that uh, your model or your system, it's understandable to a human with domain expertise, ex say experts in natural language within the particular context and use case. So for example, uh, if you look at this uh, equation on the right, uh, standard model on Grazian. And so if you show this to a physicist, and so she may say that, uh, well, my four-year-old, uh, could understand this, but for the majority of us uh, computer scientists, it may just be a, uh, just a group of uh, Greek symbols. So context, domains, application matter. And also we have to look at uh, explainability from not just from the perspective of model, but at a system level. So system uh, has its constituent parts as the solution as the user, whereas the solution is, could be made up of, say, the features, the algorithms, the parameters, and the, of course, the model itself. And so with the user, we have to take into account the person's domain knowledge, their cognitive capacity, and what level of granularity is the explanation needed? So the explanation that you're giving to a five-year-old would be very different from, say, that what you're giving to a person with, uh, say, a, a PhD in physics. And so there are a number of uh, properties or characteristics of explainable AI which have been identified in literature. Uh, that is a tutorial in its own right. Uh, but in the interest of time, we will describe a few which are of uh, interest. So the first one is simultability. That is being able to understand the whole model simultaneously. So. If you look at this example at the bottom right, so the decision tree B has this property, or at least has it much more as compared to decision tree A. And then there's decomposability, uh, that is each component is admissible uh, with respect to an uh, intuitive uh, or easy explanation. Uh, so where this idea is that, so for example, in general, when we think about um, interpretability, then naturally we think that regression models are much more easier to interpret as compared to deep learning models. But 
suppose the deep learning models are using relatively simple features like these, um, which have intuitive meaning versus a complex, highly engineered features like these, then uh, if the deep learning is model is using uh, the intuitive features versus regression model is using these engineered features, then uh, the dichotomy does not hold. And lastly, there's this expectation that uh, there's that the models comes with certain performance guarantees and or convergence. Uh, so now moving on from the domain computing side to uh, mapping explainability to physics. Uh, so the idea is that an explainable model from the physics perspective, uh, so it should be grounded in theory. Uh, and the hope is that it's more likely to safeguard against learning of spurious patterns because the theory and physics would presumably encode constraints around these patterns within the theory itself. Um, and so the question is, how can one use insights from physics to understand such models? Uh, so to illustrate, um, so we, we will use uh, models uh, which are inspired from physics. <clears throat> and so a few uh, disclaimers uh, are in order. Um, that so, these actually do not uh, cover uh, all uh, possible types of models uh, which are which one can envision where uh, physics inspired models could be used uh, to create better alg algorithms or improve models but rather we are just restricting our uh, uh, current discussion to particular domains uh, so these models are especially useful uh, in uh, data limited domains where large scale data collection lags behind theory. Uh, so the problem is that how can we use uh, or constrain algorithms to leverage domain specific uh, physics knowledge, uh, which satisfies certain principles. So for example, conservation of momentum or conservation of mass, um, so on and so forth. So which brings us to uh, work on physics informed neural networks, uh, where the idea is that, uh, so we use these from, for the purpose of the classical tasks that we use uh, neural nets, uh, but we can incorporate certain things like, let's say uh, laws, certain laws of physics, uh, for example, say nonlinear partial differential equations, uh, and there are different ways uh, to do this, uh, taking a more uh, theory-based approach versus a more data-driven approach. Uh, one limitation that these models has is that in general, they are designed for very specific uh, tasks or groups of tasks. Uh, an ideal situation would be where if we can identify architectures that would be capable of adapting to say variations in the correctness of physics, quality of training, training data. Um, so this work is still in, in infancy. Uh, some progress has been made. Uh, uh, so for example, in the form of uh, work by, on autophysics, uh, which focuses on uh, automatically finding optimal architectures for physics-based models. And complementing that is work in uh, physics on what the authors call uh, physics guided neural networks. And so they take this, uh, tackle this problem from three different perspectives. Uh, so one is that uh, the more traditional approach, which is that uh, feature engineering is informed by theories and domain knowledge from physics. Uh, second is that uh, adding physical constraints. Uh, so for example, let's say add regularization term to punish, punish or fitting, um, what is known as the physical inconsistency term. Uh, so when you optimize uh, physically inconsistent results, and we'll look at an example of that shortly, are minimized. So the goal is that to have a model which is readily interpretable um, and also uh, does not violate uh, constraints in the real world. Um, uh, that said, there are a few issues. Um, uh, one should be mindful of um, or thinks 
things from domain which can actually be helpful in creating such models. Um, so for example, in uh, uh, physics domain knowledge can be used in parameter initialization. Uh, so it can uh, help, it's been shown that it can help in say not getting stuck in uh, local minimas. Uh, we can also define priors, uh, which can be used to constrain the search space. Uh, another way to do that is to also define what are admissible values. Um, and so that can also guide the optimization uh, direction. Uh, and you can even further constrain the optimization uh, problem by uh, defining uh, physically consistent uh, classification boundaries. All right, so to illustrate, uh, we are going to use uh, the following example. Uh, all right, so the task is that, so we have to build a model which can predict water temperature as functions of depth and time for a lake. So there are already physics-based models uh, that exist, so the general lake model. And so it captures the physical processes um, by, for example, uh, capturing certain relationships uh, like let's say we, it's known that denser water sinks um, and to which corresponds to the relationship between water temperature and density. <clears throat> and so say if the model predicts the higher density for a point closer to the surface, then well, that's in physically inconsistent. Uh, so that said, uh, phenomenon, the real world is much more complicated. There are a host of, fe of features with respect to say uh, the weather, uh, composition of water um, and other factors which uh, affect uh, what is actually recorded and observed. So within the loss function, um, so we can actually incorporate this, uh, that um, whenever there's a consistency, then uh, we punish the model. And when the consistency higher, then the model is punished more. And it's not just uh, keeping into account pairs of uh, points, but we have to look at all pos all uh, recorded uh, pairs of points. So that's why uh, we are taking the max, uh, the max over all pairs and dividing that by by the number of pairs when creating the loss function. And so we can also control the relative importance of uh, minimizing the physical uh, consistency. So this is analogous to multiplying the, the average physical in, in, inconsistency with a hyperparameter. And if you really think about it, that's very similar to how we think about um, regularization parameters. So these are the results from two different lakes uh, in uh, Minnesota, uh, lakes uh, Mendota and Lake uh, Millilax. Uh, so the main thing to focus is the physics-based models. So this is a classic, the classic physics-based models. Uh, quantities are defined, so the the predictions are not going to be uh, to vary from a particular um, value. And results from just using the data, so the features, using a neural network, uh, and then a neural network. Uh, which is using results from a generalized model and the physics guided neural network approach that I just described. Uh, and so the remarkable thing is that not only do in terms of uh, physical inconsistency, so we of course do not get any physical inconsistency in the physics based model as well as uh, uh, as well as the uh, the proposed model, but the adder bar, the adder itself, um, is actually much less than just a, using a purely uh, physics-based model. So that's another argument uh, for merging of these two approaches. So from uh, illustrating an example to now we move on to uh, open questions in neural networks and deep learning in general. So consider the, these, these questions uh, in this slide. So why don't heavily parameterized neural networks overfit the data? What is the effective number of parameters? Uh, why doesn't back propagation get stuck in local minima? Uh, 
Um, and so if you think about these, uh, these are very modern relevant questions for 2020. And yet uh, these are questions, open questions from a paper by Bremen from 1995. So 25 years later, we are still wrestling with the same questions. And to this, we'll add that, uh, that why do neural networks approximate functions well in practice? That is, why do they work so well in general? Um, uh, so before we delve into some of these, uh, so a few things um, require special uh, mention. Uh, that, uh, so although uh, many uh, techniques in AI and ML have their origins or inspiration in statistical physics, um, a physics style theory of deep learning does not exist, however. Um, there are some uh, attempts here and there which have yielded interesting uh, results or what I'd like to call uh, gleams of uh, uh, gems, uh, but there's no meta theory uh, that exists right now. All right, so we will start with uh, this work uh, by Henry Lin, uh, uh, Max Tegmark, um, and R Rolnick, um, where they try to address at a very high level the question of why does deep learning work well in practice? Uh, so the argument is as follows. Um, so coming, this is coming from uh, the three researchers from the physics background. So the laws of physics constitute an exponentially tiny fraction of all possible inputs. If you look at the practical applications of AI and deep learning, that also constitutes a tiny a fraction of all possible data. And so these data sets, they are generated by some statistical pro processes. And if these processes have a certain hierarchical form, then deep learning uh, models, uh, they are likely to be more efficient than a shallow one to model, model them. And their reasoning is that uh, if we go from data to say very high level phenomenon, uh, then and uh, in physics and at the corresponding level, if you look at, um, this is of course a toy example um, uh, on the right hand side. And if you look at uh, in the computing domain, the problems that we are trying to solve that there is a quote unquote a natural hierarchy um, uh, in terms of uh, concepts and connections uh, connections between different levels of granularity that exists, um, and because that is constrained, um, that is possible to be captured by a deep learning network, uh, because it can be described in a certain form. So that's an extremely high level uh, way of looking at things. Um, uh, more closer to theory um, is more, some recent work on information bottlenecks and neural networks. Uh, so the theory of information bottlenecks has been around for a while. Um, so the idea is that, so when information is, is flowing through a certain types of architectures, uh, and again, this is not just applicable to deep learning networks, but to a host of other uh, networks that when information is, is traveling, uh, then, uh, then, uh, then through the process of uh, information, information bottlenecks, um, information is is summarized uh, extraneous information can get lost so that only only the relevant information is preserved so what do we mean by that um, so basically what we are doing is what the process does is identify the most informative uh, features and remove extraneous ones uh, so in the parlance of information theory, what we are doing is that we are minimizing the distance between the mutual information of the, of the 
original data and the uh, compressed version with respect to the target variable. All right, so let's explore this. Uh, before exploring this in a little uh, more detail, um, so let, I'll first talk about the uh, inspiration behind this. Um, so just over a decade ago, it was observed that a special case of deep belief networks work exactly like renormalization. Where renormalization is a technique which is used in physics. Um, so think of this as coarse graining over say certain descriptions of certain details of a system, uh, it's mainly to avoid uh, infinities and being able to com compute the overall uh, state of the system. So in 20, a few years after that, uh, two uh, biophysicists, Schwab and Mehta, uh, they applied deep belief networks to a model uh, of a magnet at its critical point. And what they discovered was that the network automatically used the renormalization uh, like procedures to discover the model state. So it, it, that spark uh, of inspiration became the foundation of uh, Tishby's uh, work on deep learning and uh, information bottlenecks. So uh, Tishby had worked on information uh, bottlenecks uh, prior to that. So here's the experiment that he and his student uh, performed. Uh, all right. So start with the neural network. Uh, the task is binary classification. So assign random initial weights and observe what, how the network evolves. And so for each, uh, for different layers in the, in the network, so compute, uh, uh, say how much information um, there is. And what they observed was that, uh, is that over the course of iterations, the network converges to the information bottleneck theoretical bound. Um, so it seems that the network is actually learning some minimal representation. Uh, so we can think of this as moving from one layer to the other, to the other as learning the different hierarchies of concepts. So this, in a little more detail, this is what's going on, that uh, within the each uh, deep learning network, uh, when you move on from the previous layer to the next, uh, some information is uh, getting lost. And uh, yet, and yet uh, information with respect to the target variable, so that is still being preserved. And we can define this in uh, this whole process in terms of uh, memorization and compression. So at the beginning of uh, the informational bottleneck process, uh, so what the network tries to do is that if you look at the number of bits that the network is storing, it either remains constant or it's roughly uh, or slightly increases uh, as the network changes its connections to encode the patterns in the input data. And this is very similar to uh, our researchers have described this as uh, being analogous to memorization. But after some time, the network starts to lose information and it only keeps the features that correlate strongly with the target variable. So what's going on over here? So one way to think about this is that so each iteration of the stochastic gradient descent, the network updates the strength of the connections via the random walks. As the network cycles through training examples, um, it might forget uh, weaker uh, correlations. So as, so as a real world example, consider the following. So suppose we have, a, let's say a toy model that seeks to learn uh, cats versus dogs uh, recognize them in images. When we initially build the model, um, it's going through training examples and it sees that cat dogs are always in front of, let's say dog houses. And so it learns that as a feature. But over the course, uh, course of time, it encounters new examples um, uh, where the dog house is not present. And so it starts to forget those correlations. 
So which brings us to another example, uh, the committee machine. Uh, so this, uh, so this uh, corresponds to, um, or this uh, terminology corresponds to, especially in the in the in the 1980s and early 90s, the researchers in the especially in the physics community, working at the intersection of neural nets and physics, uh, looking at certain uh, type of ensemble uh, methods. So that's the, where the terminology comes from. So we're going to consider, uh, or many of these consider the simplest version of a two-layered neural network. The weights in the second layer are fixed to unity or one. So this is your standard task of, uh, have of the, um, the target variable and dimensional sample and weights uh, connected to each uh, layer. And the particular setting is what is known as the student teacher approach. So the labels are generated by feeding IID random samples to a neural net, which is the teacher. The output then gets presented to another neural network, um, which is a student for training. And so from this physics community, a number of results uh, on this uh, uh, somewhat simple model have been observed, which may have, if they could be, uh, generalized to other neural networks can hold very promising results. So one thing which was observed, well, interesting result is that, uh, uh, so if alpha is the sample complexity, then we observed that uh, alpha spec is a critical value where there's a permutation symmetry between hidden neurons uh, that remains conserved even after optimal learning. And remarkably enough, the learned weights of each of the hidden neurons are identical. Um, but beyond that particular value, the symmetry no longer holds. Um, and the reason for that is that, um, is that as each of the hidden uh, units uh, correlate strongly with the corresponding uh, hidden units of the teacher. Uh, and again, another, remarkable thing being that the optimal generalization error can, can actually be described in terms of the, the sample complexity. Um, again, going back to the theme of uh, phase transitions, so it's also observed that uh, the optimal error corresponds to a particular weight configuration. And that weight configuration is the same for every hidden unit. And if you think about it, that uh, would actually remind one of a simple uh, regression model. And also going back to the specialization threshold, um, that when the number of, of units exceeds that threshold, then what we observed is that uh, is that the different hidden units learn different weights um, which uh, actually improve the generalization error. And there's also what is known as the hard phase where uh, we, we do see that we can get good generalization uh, from a, let's say at least from my information theoretical perspective, but not necessarily uh, from a practical perspective as, um, the number of hidden units goes. So which brings us to the, er the area of uh, GANs. Uh, so those in the audience who may not be familiar with GANs, uh, so these are uh, these models, uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, so they formulate the problem of building neural networks as a two player uh, non-cooperative minimax uh, game in the sense of game theory. Um, so it has two sub uh, parts. So one is the generator. It's a model for generating new examples and a discriminator which uh, discriminates whether the example of real and fake. Uh, if you have seen any uh, deep fakes, then uh, you would be familiar with these models. Um, so using a host of variety of settings, uh, in addition to that. Uh, 
Uh, that said, uh, cl the classical formulation of gas, they do suffer from a number of issues uh, with respect to, uh, uh, let's say, instability, mode collapse, and having a lack of reliable metrics to determine the quality. Uh, so a variant of uh, GANs, which is of interest, is what are known as Wessestein GAN. Uh, so the difference is that instead of a, in the previous uh, uh, formulation, instead of a discriminator, we have a critic. Uh, instead of saying that uh, reject or accept as real or fake, we, the critic says, scores the realness or fakeness of the data uh, which is generated. Um, the motivation behind this is that uh, the training the generator should minimize the distance between the training and the generated data distributions. And so th this point is, is very important. So taking that as the foundation, um, so some physicists came up with um, you know, banach wesserstein gan which is a generalization of Wesserstein GANs, um, where, uh, which actually is, allows one, uh, the practitioners, the people who are using GANs to select the features to emphasize in the gener degenerator. Um, so the idea behind the uh, Wesserstein metric was that uh, we're looking at the, the, distribu the distance of distribution, uh, probability distributions in the images um, and so we can, if we extend this to other, to this uh, Banach uh, space, uh, then we can generalize this uh, notion and create uh, much better models. Um, as a side note, uh, we, can, uh, we can actually extend these to more traditional metric spaces, uh, but in practice, uh, that does not seem to work as well. And of course, that, in addition to that, there has been work in Incop creating uh, stochastic differential equations into the architecture of GANs, uh, uh, having solvable models of GANs, so on and so forth. Uh, so continuing the theme of uh, deep learning. Um, so there is some work uh, with respect to the challenge of over parameterization in deep learning. So the challenge is that the number of parameters has been observed in deep learning, it scales with data, which translates into cost of training, uh, as we talked about at the beginning of the tutorial. Uh, it scales, um, so it's a product of parameters and number of uh, uh, data points that we are dealing with, computational, products in an ideal, the computation requirements ideally are quad, quadratic, but in practice they are much more because uh, in order to get linear improvement in performance, you actually need data which scales much faster than uh, linearly. So that is a problem of cost. Okay. So to illustrate, um, we are going to use a couple of examples. And so, so for, but first, the reason that this is a problem is that, so we actually don't have a good theoretical understanding of relationship between performance, model complexity, and computational uh, requirements for deep learning architectures in general. Uh, and the other remarkable thing, uh, we also alluded to this uh, earlier, is that um, in practice, these models, uh, they, they if this was a more classical setting uh, for machine learning models, this would result in uh, overfitting, but this does not happen. Uh, so uh, one famous, so here are an example of uh, some models. Um, uh, and their number of parameters. Um, and so the number of data, data points that we are dealing with, it's just 50,000. and. Uh, performance is, is increasing. We are not incurring um, uh, said loss in terms of, uh, let's say, overfitting. Um, an extreme example is the noisy student model, which has 480 million parameters, while ImageNet only has 1.2 million data points. <laughs> 
Well, let's consider this example. Um, so we start with uh, corrupting the training labels by replacing them with a random label. So for example, in this case, replacing with, this is eight, but we randomly mislabel it at zero. And so what we observe is that um, the test accuracy um, actually does not uh, degrade uh, as much. Um, and if, if we actually have uh, early, early stopping in our model, um, uh, then uh, the test accuracy is, is actually pretty remarkable. So which means that the model is learning something. Um, here's, here's another overview of that, um, is that as even with a 50 person label corruption, um, we do get uh, overfitting, but uh, on the, if you look at the training data, but the performance is remarkably good on, with respect to the test uh, accuracy. So there's, there's some sort of learning going on. Okay. So now uh, putting some of these things together. So one is that, um, so what is going on? So ideally what we want uh, in a real world setting is to be in a scenario where we have reduced the computational complexity. We have uh, models with generalized better. And so the hope is that uh, physics may offer uh, some help in finding these ar alternative architectures which can integrate physics, model, physics no knowledge into these models. Um, and we can use, and there has been some progress in this re regard with respect to the marriage of say symbolic approaches uh, with more traditional uh, connectionist uh, approaches. Uh, so to conclude uh, this section on physics and deep learning. So there are multiple points of intersection between physics and deep learning. There is great potential to advance theory and practice, uh, provide theoretical foundations, and of course save money. Uh, so in the second half uh, of the tutorial, so my colleague uh, is actually going to uh, discuss some additional points of synergies in a much more technical detail than I did. So that brings us to another set of models, the stochastic block models. Uh, so the block models have their origin in social network analysis. Um, where the idea is that we're giving large graphs and we want to detect communities in these graphs. So think about detecting communities in uh, say Facebook or Instagram uh, social networks uh, and also do model such networks. And it was discovered that the standard formulations of these, uh, they actually do not, um, are not able to replicate real world networks. So from, so an additional uh, constraint was added, so hence the term stochastic block models, where the constraint being that um, we also give an asymmetric matrix of edge probabilities which describes probabilities of being connected from one community to the other. So for example, if this is our network, then uh, each blocks correspond to a particular community. So connections with, within the community versus connections across uh, communities. Um, so a lot of work in this area also has its roots in uh, physics again, uh, especially in the 1980s and um, a renewed interest in more recent times. Um, and what the, and so there are a few key re re results that I'll mention is that uh, what the physicists observed and discovered was that uh, it's possible to determine the optimal performance and identify regions or parameters where uh, such performance can be reached by belief propagation algorithms. And again, going back to the theme around phase transitions, that there's a separation between phases, uh, which is characterized by where one, it is possible to cl clustering where it is not possible to do so. Uh, so that was an overview of uh, some 
models. Uh, so now we move on to limitations of these physics inspired uh, models. We start with an ideal scenario where, uh, so ideally physics uh, should be a, physics may provide foundations for AI models and in, and, uh, deep, and deep learning and machine learning models and approaches. Uh, so if we just focus our attention to hybrid approaches, then well, uh, parameters still need to be calibrated. It's possible to overfit. Uh, they're maybe computationally expensive. Uh, the physics models may be uh, incomplete, uh, mainly because of there's this thing known as the scale accuracy trade-off. Uh, that is at different scales, we have to use approximate models, uh, which may result in biased models. So th that's a known trade-off. There's limitation with respect to uh, solvability. So, uh, so many physics-based approaches, so they uh, deal with uh, toy models uh, because they can, that can yield uh, elegant uh, solvable solutions. Uh, it, mapping this to the machine learning domain. So it, like it's possible to, for example, describe and formulate, uh, uh, let's say uh, error estimation. And, but the, the disadvantage being that uh, mainstream learning theory uh, in uh, computing actually deals with worst case bounds. Uh, so an ideal scenario would be if these two approaches could be uh, combined, if there's a way to uh, make them complementary. Uh, another limitation is, uh, at least for a subset of models, replicating model behaviors. Um, so generalizing these two models for which very interesting detailed results which are present, let's say committee machines, uh, and student teacher settings to much more complex architectures. Um, and uh, also to replicate aspects of the models which are observed in practical uh, applications and practical architectures. And, let, and related to that is letting go of certain assumptions. Uh, so that's, that's a problem which also exists uh, in machine learning. So. Uh, model the data not no longer as IID, but as so some other way. So there has been some area, uh, some research in this area in the last couple of years. Um, uh, and then there's, uh, of course, the problem of generalizability, at least for certain class of physics inspired models that I alluded to earlier, that uh, they are for specific tasks and class of problems. So ideally what we want is models uh, which can work with different levels of correctness with noise, mi data mis missingness and other data limitations. And also for certain extremely complex phenomenon like complex adaptive systems, traditional physics based approaches have limitations. Um, so for example, uh, trying to model and understand extremely complex phenomenon like society, whole economies. Uh, so in those domains, we have what are known as complex adaptive system approaches, uh, which understandingly actually have take their inspiration from physics also. And so the ideal uh, scenario in this case would be again, to take a, a top down bottom approach, up approach uh, from both directions from physics and AI, uh, which could address certain problems. So to conclude the first half of uh, the tutorial, uh, so AI and physics have a long history of interaction and uh, cross correlation. Um, um, AI and machine learning uh, face a uh, number of challenges and with challenges come opportunities. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities which are available uh, for collaboration and progress. Uh, the synergy between physics and AI offers potentials to gain insights into the foundations of AI and even bring advancement um, in AI with uh, say new algorithms and new models of thinking. 
Um, so in the second half of the tutorial, uh, so my colleague uh, uh, will go over uh, uh, synergies between physics and AI at a more fundamental uh, foundational level and with greater uh, theoretical rigor. Um, and so if there are any follow-up questions, uh, even after this tutorial, uh, please feel, feel free to email either one of us. And additionally, we also maintain a project website with a set of resources, um, with a survey of the field, uh, conferences, uh, relevant research work, research agendas. Uh, you're more than welcome to check those out. Uh, thank you.